All right, welcome everybody again to Friends Occasionally Not Disagreeing. Um, we're here today to talk about pro wrestling, pro wrestling, um, which is something I have long had a uh, fondness for that has been rekindled as of recently, but we know may have some stigmas with it as well. I'm Cody, and uh, co host tonight is. Hi, I'm Brett. So there we go. Just the two of us here tonight. And um, it's a topic that we thought we might want to include for the podcast uh, because we do have several people in the group who are, well, they have a, a long history, I guess, of watching and being into wrestling in general and possibility that this could spawn some future episodes as well with some specific topics down the road um, lot that we could cover here um, from our many years of watching wrestling. Uh, I guess we'll start with maybe just um, how we got into pro wrestling on this one. And then um, we have some other topics here we'll take a look at. Um, do you want to go first, Brett? Yeah, sure. I could do that. Uh, so I would say my history with, with pro wrestling is kind of, um, it, it's a limited window, to be honest. I was aware of wrestling and some of the, the larger characters of it. Um you know, kind of earlier on when I was a kid, like like early teens or so, I would say is probably when I first kind of started noticing these things. And, um, you know, there's like, you know, Hogan and, and Macho Man. And, and these characters were, you know, there there's enough merchandise out there that I, you know, you'd see these things like in the store and toy store or something or, you know, on an advertisement or thing. So like I was aware of things, but um, being where we lived, uh, out in the country, we only, we only had the four basic channels. Oh yeah, and uh, you know the occasionally you'd get like Fox and like Fuzzy, you know, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so I I don't know what channels these were on typically, but I, I'm certain we didn't get any of them because I, I don't remember watching any wrestling really until um, until we had gotten satellite, which was about ninety, I say like ninety three or ninety four something like that. Okay. Um, I think it was about the first time I actually, actually really watched any kind of wrestling, but um, you know, then once we got, that was basically right. I was getting to high school and um, you know, as, as, as our friend group, you know, really started kind of having this at like a, a centerpiece of, of, you know, several things that we were interested in, but you know, it was certainly one of the highlights. Um, and then, so that was what it really took off for me was, was when we started all watching together and, and doing all those things. And um, really, it, it just kind of, for me, kind of tapered off even like after high school, when I didn't have that group of people to watch with, mm -hmm. I kind of lost interest a bit. And I would say I haven't really, I haven't paid attention to wrestling um, other than, you know, getting a few bits and pieces here and there. Uh, probably haven't really paid attention to it in like 15 years or so okay yeah you know, something in that range yeah that's a it's another interesting perspective because i feel like we have uh, and i'll talk about my history here too but i feel like there's different groups of people different generations or different people who hit it at different periods in their life kind of like you're saying and you know for some of those people they've come back for some of those people they never never came back some of those people kind of you know wavered back and forth a little bit here and there and um yeah, that okay. So that's interesting to know because I didn't. I guess I didn't know your full um, experience either. But yeah, for me, this was. I'm, tr I'm trying to think. Maybe I could put this into probably like four phases, and I'm just coming up with this on the spot here. But um, I got into this really early, like early '80s, probably like '85. I could probably remember watching wrestling, but I'm sure I watched it before that as well i just don't have a memory of it before sure, yeah. it does. um the the venn diagram of my father and i's um interests is very small overlap and uh this was always one that he had interest in that i also like to watch um and he still watches today like i don't even three four five nights a week like it's pretty crazy now so uh, <laughs> that's cool just, yeah it's just on all the time so so i know when i was young like um wwf then at the time had you know hogan and even andre the giant was back still at that time the macho man and um 
Jake the Snake and all those type of people were there. Um, and then we'd also watch the NWA at the time, which had um, mostly like Dusty Rhodes, Ric Flair, the Road Warriors, um, and some other people as well. And then every once in a while, I'd go to my uh, grandparents' house in town, and I think it was on ESPN, I want to say. They had world-class wrestling out of Dallas, which was like another smaller one at the time um, that I randomly happened to be there seemingly like every few weeks for. So I'd catch an episode of that too when it was on. And I only like marginally knew who the heck I was even watching, but it was fun just to see like a different company's thing that they were doing. So, so that was probably like the, my origin. Uh, and then the second phase probably was like the, the attitude Monday night kind of era where it kind of sounds like you're more at here with like the WCW then as the replacement for NWA and then we had um was well, still WWF at that time I think or was, I forget when it switched to WWE I believe so yeah when those yeah, it was like Panda Bear sued them <laughs> <laughs> yeah I feel like that was like late 90s or early okay. 2000s when that happened and then uh ECW was around that time period too which I used to watch here and there I used to have to wake up at like I don't even know. I'd set my alarm and wake up at like one or two in the morning on Saturdays to go find the Madison Square Garden channel on satellite and watch the one hour ECW show and then go back to bed. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then that was kind of like the glory days, if you will. And then the third, the third phase probably for me was attempting to rekindle that love of wrestling. Like, um, cause after WCW went out of business, which could be a whole nother episode. Um, WWE like never sustained my full attention for a long time and I was trying like different alternative products that were out there and um, TNA was one total nonstop action and later was called impact wrestling and it was kind of fun kind of reminded me of like WCW like if you could picture like the how bad the writing was for WCW in retrospect afterwards like they were <laughs> somehow even worse than that I don't know how but I think they might have been <laughs> that's incredible yeah i know right and then um the one that i did find that i stuck around with for a little bit was a show called lucha underground um which yeah i think in many ways did rekindle not only my love for wrestling but also open my eyes to like what modern wrestling could be like and so i watched um problem was i couldn't get that because it's was on the El Rey network, which I've never had on any cable package huh. I've ever had. So I ended up, yeah, I don't even know where we'd find that. Yeah. I ended up like watching a season on YouTube, I think. And then, um, I think I'm, I think they might've had seasons you could purchase on Amazon prime. So I think I maybe watched a couple seasons of it that way too, but I loved that and loved the characters and the stories and like kind of got back into it a little bit. And then that went out of business. And then fast forward to today when, um, I watch, uh, all elite wrestling AEW. this is kind of phase four now my kids got into it a little bit with me and kind of have since drifted back off of it a little bit more but like they know enough to like know who's on tv if they come in or like theme musics and so there's kind of like some some fun bonding moments there and certain meals will like eat in front of the tv and i just put it on and don't really give them a choice what we're watching so <laughs> so that's kind of like the the modern phase i guess um Oh, and I guess there was like when I lived in the UP too. I guess there was like the local promotion I would go to as well. Shout out to UPW Wrestling. Um, still going strong. Still going. Yeah, went out of business like six times, but it's back again. So <laughs> it's the story of a good, good story, I guess. So I, I, in fact, I just saw something come up. On, I think it was on Facebook. It must have been Facebook. I don't have anywhere yeah. else. <laughs> so still going. I don't know. I think they got the Rock and Roll Express coming there for the next one, or else they were just there, even though they're like 70 or something. But. <laughs> still rocking. <Yeah>. <laughs> still rocking. Yeah, exactly right. <laughs> exactly right. Okay. Um, so I guess maybe we mentioned going into this next segment here. Um, this is a hard one to understand. I, I, I fail to put this entirely in words. I keep coming into the word stigma, but I don't know if that's that's one angle of it, I think, but it's not the only thing. So there's like, you know, what makes a pro wrestling fan? How is that person seen by society? And why do some people refuse to open their minds to try this product? I think are kind of like different areas, but all related. Um, mm -hmm. And so... 
I don't know. Now you had mentioned, you may have a different perspective on this. You had mentioned like you didn't get into this until maybe your teens. So like, did you know right. what pro wrestling was prior to that? Um, not, not in the sense that um, I, I didn't know it was essentially all scripted and you know, basically like set out like a TV show. I, I just, at that point, I assumed, well, this is all just, <laughs> this is what, it, what are they showing? This is what's actually happening. Yeah. So yeah, I, I still, um, at, at the first time I started watching it, um, yeah, I was not fully in the loop. Okay. Yeah. yeah and that's a good, and that's kind of, I don't know, you know, like I've gone to, I think three, three or four shows in the last two years now um, in big arenas. And it's like, there's definitely a type of fan still to this day, like the, you know, kind of fanboy crazy, like most people in polite society probably wouldn't interact with this person <laughs> if they met them on the side of the street. People get really, really, really into this. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if it's any different than like, you know, I saw a website earlier was like kind of comparing it to like comic books. Like if, you know, when we were in high school, like if, even if we were like, hey, we read comic books. Like that would have been shunned by most people. Yeah. And now like Endgame makes a billion dollars. Like, so <laughs> who's you know, the Joker now? Exactly. It's like oh. society has kind of changed and like what they, I don't know, like geek and nerd culture has kind of taken over so many things. Yeah. It's certainly things like this are, are much more widely accepted now. Um, people just are, they're, they're allowing you to have what you like to be kind of like an okay thing yeah <laughs> if, if they don't like it um people are a bit more um uh, accepting of that there is yeah there is yes i think you're right it's definitely more accepted now than it was probably when we watched deep well when we watched it was probably like a hot spot i guess too so maybe it was a little more accepted then than before or after that but I, don't know, I feel like if you go up to somebody of like a it, particularly an older generation than us you know and just like hey i watch pro wrestling they'd be like Oh, <laughs> right. and you know nose in the air and yada yada <laughs> um but it's, I, I struggled to like come up with this so i'm trying to think like my wife for example will has sworn many times will not watch wrestling with us like if i won a bet to like take her to an event like there is zero chance she would ever cash in on that and actually follow <laughs> through um, she has kind of come around to like sitting in the room while it is on because that was like a stage we were at for a long time that that would not happen okay. as well. So she's kind yeah. of come around to that and the fact that the kids like know some of the theme musics and some of the people and stuff like she kind of I think is more surrounded by it but but I do still feel like there's like some sense of uh, I don't know like polite society still kind of frowns upon this like i put him on the spot here because he's not here but our friend dave i know um you know like there's no way in hell he would ever watch this because he just believes it's like violence for the sake of violence and yada right. yada which i see um i can see how we could look at it that way yeah it's just, just tricky because he, you know if you were like hey come watch this with me and they were like I don't want to watch this or this is stupid because you know like if you start with well it's fake and like just get like that's your first sentence like get that out of the way first then like they're like oh well this is fake <laughs> I like, I, I, to go for that's that, like yeah. 80% of the argument I feel like for people is like it's yeah. not real and it's like yeah well neither is the bachelor or neither is <laughs> yep. you know this tom cruise movie that's about to come out or whatever the case 95 is 95 percent of what you watch is is not real <laughs> yeah exactly exactly and then it's like okay i have even back when we watched and like i feel like the wrestlers today are so much more um athletic than when we watched too like we yes. were in the age of the like powerhouses and you know now they're like jumping up onto the ropes and then jumping onto the corner and then jumping off into the outside and it's like it's like they're i don't know a wrestler to me has always been a pretty special person if they're good at what they do because like if you could pick any of the pro sports you can be a great athlete but like wrestlers also have to be good at like acting like they also have to be acting and they also have to know lines and they have to give promos and like it's 
it's far more of a package. I feel like than most of the, you know, like I throw a football cause I'm a quarterback or whatever the case is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You really can't. Um, I, I don't, I don't think there'd be anyone in pro wrestling who would make it um, to any high tier of, of the entertainment industry without having natural charisma and personality. Yeah. You know, you, you could be, um, you know, there's, there's plenty when we were watched, you know, there's lots of really technical, like actually really good wrestlers that could, you know, did all this stuff. And, um, you know, I, I certainly don't remember those don't stick out as my head nearly as much as the, the personalities mm. of the sport. I just think it's impressive because they have to like one stay in shape, like whatever their character is, they kind of have to maintain that build, whether it's muscle or fat or, you know, a certain way they look with their hair or their facial hair or whatever, you know, ladies kind of have like Mm. unrealistic expectations i guess in this in this area too but it's like you're you have to stay like what your character is like they joke about in the marvel movies how there's like this shot with the guy with the shirt off every marvel movie and like <laughs> if you're a wrestler man or a woman like you're expected to look like a greek god or goddess like every yeah. time you step into the ring so that has to yeah yeah like i say a big difference from uh like the 80s and 90s when it was okay to be to look quite out of shape as long as you were like bulky yeah <laughs> you know? no absolutely. And, and, and now all these people are like ultra chiseled chiseled and six packs and 12 packs and yeah no absolutely <laughs> packs on their arms and legs i definitely think you're right too about like having to be the complete package because if you look at like batista or the rock or like these people that have crossed over into movies like they are you know more charismatic mm-hmm. personality wise but also have like that the body build too. Yeah. That kind of goes with it. So, um, I don't know, I guess I would say if you're like a person who hasn't watched before or is hesitant to even give this a shot, like to me, it's like, it's like you're watching live gymnastics with like the routines that they do and the moves that they do and mix that with like, they tell a story like you're, you're like, nobody would bat an eye or ever criticize someone for going to like, the theater to watch a performance but basically if it's in like a four-sided wrestling ring they're like oh i don't know about that (laughs) but it's basically the same thing yeah um yeah i I don't think anybody would um you know the the, the storytelling and things that happen um you know it would rarely be uh described as as poetry (laughs) but but they are very fun and they're very unpredictable yeah and um it, yeah it's there's you're always getting there's there's drama there's comedy yeah um there's there's just like i say just unpredictability you don't really know what's going to happen even though like they know what's going to happen yeah. generally but but anything really could happen and um by the nature of it kind of understanding that it's it has that unpredictability they can do almost anything and as a wrestling fan you you mostly accept it Mm-hmm. and say oh wow that was whatever you thought of it you know good or bad or whatever but it uh you're like yeah okay this is something that can happen in my <laughs> in this realm here yeah well yeah and you're right there's like the world of the show you're watching where different things <laughs> happen in different ways than you know real life would happen like i don't know wouldn't do a contract signing in front of 20,000 people in an arena just to make sure we have this thing set for two Sundays from now or whatever the case is but <laughs> yeah no but I definitely agree like it's any if, really if you think about like any plot from a movie that people would watch like that could play out in pro wrestling whether it's like the underdog story or the revenge story or I mean it's it's all it is it's those classic themes like recycled through again and wrestling is more impressive in some ways too another thing we could talk about is like how other sports have seasons and wrestling really doesn't so like they go year round and like you have to find a way to as the writer of the show or as the performer on the show you have to find a way to like keep your character interesting for year after year after year yeah that's absolutely true because you know you think about any kind of tv show or anything you know they're, they're writing for half a year and then they're producing for half a year yeah. and as as a wrestling promotion you you really don't have any downtime and they even have multiple episodes per week typically yeah so 
yeah, imagine like ha- writing all that and and coordinating and and getting all that choreographed. That's that's got to be a, a lot of work. Yeah, it's pretty impressive when you think about it that way. I thought it'd be fun to write a show, but I know it'd be really challenging too. And <laughs> you open yourself up to so much criticism instantly. I know that, but um, yeah, no, I definitely agree with that though. And then like too, you know, it's like going back to that gymnastics idea. It's not like, you know, like I'm sure, I'm sure if I'm like the rock or somebody Dwayne Johnson and I'm like making jungle cruise for Disney and like somebody messes up and they're like, Cut, we'll just do another take and you know he the back of his mind he's probably like wait what another shot like because they do everything live so it's like the first shot is all you get like you got to be perfect on the first take or bluff it pretty well probably is uh <laughs> probably nice they probably enjoy when they can do things more 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 times than one I often wondered like when something because uh, there's no way that things always go as planned they must be you know, there's, there's always things that like, don't, you know, don't go as they were expecting. And so I've yep. always wondered like how they, how they kind of adapt for that. If they have like contingencies, like planned ahead of time, like if they say like, oh, if, if this move fails, if like I fall down or something, you do this to cover it and then yeah. we'll, we'll sync back up later. They, they must think about those things, but it'd be interesting to kind of be in that circle to, to know that. Yeah, it's all, I mean, and another thing too is like I've compared it to gymnastics, but it's really not because like you have to have a performer in there with you that you're like playing off of the whole time as well, or at least one. Sometimes there's more than just the two people. Um, but, you know, it just made me think of like I watched a match um, this past Wednesday and it was like two guys that they said had never fought before. And this new promotion has been pretty good about keeping track of that stuff. And like the one guy climbed the turnbuckle to jump and like very blatantly was like, like trying to move the other guy over and he did it like two or three times until the guy got in the right spot and then he jumped. (laughs) But in my head, I was like, I was like, Oh, like that guy, you know, didn't know how to do his move correctly. And then like, now I'm thinking about it more and I'm like, well, maybe the other guy wasn't standing in the right spot. Like it's because it's two people. So it's hard to say, right. (laughs) Hard to say who's right and who's wrong. So, um, yeah. Okay. Well, if you haven't watched before, really, seriously give it a shot um i'm sure we could probably recommend some matches to you if you're interested in finding a couple on youtube or if you have the well you probably don't have the wwe network if you're not a wrestling fan at the moment, i suppose <laughs> <Not likely. but. laughs> um okay do we want to go into so we thought we kind of do like a little primer today some of our favorite wrestlers some of our favorite matches um favorite feuds maybe or favorite moments do you have a preference where we go next on this? Do you want to do wrestlers next? Or do you want to save that for last? Do you want to do some of the other moments? Um, I was thinking probably saving wrestler list for, for last. That kind of feels almost like a like we typically do as a yeah t- countdown kind of thing. So okay. Maybe we'll go to um like a favorite. What do you want to do? Favorite type of match, favorite feud. Yeah, maybe like type of matches that kind of leads into um Okay. More kind of general things, explanations. Yeah. All right. Um, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I made a list of, of several here. Uh, I, I think the, the classic battle Royale is probably my favorite. Um, it's cause there's, there's so much, you know, you, you start out with, with just to explain it to, um, anybody who doesn't yeah, know the type of match, please. um, you start out with, with two wrestlers that, uh, they um i think generally they are like draw numbers out of a hat or whatever and and then whoever gets one and two go in the ring first and they start doing their thing fighting each other and then after a set amount of time say it's like i don't even know what it is like 30 seconds or something probably it's uh, it's a little bit it's like a minute and a half it's or usually, something it's, it's usually it's a little bit. quick but maybe like a minute say like a minute okay um so like after every minute there are four or thereafter um, the next wrestler in the uh, in the list comes out and joins the fight. So you could very quickly, if um, you know, typically because the, the first people are going to be fresh and strong and you know full of energy, they're not going to go out right away. So you can very quickly get five, 10, 15 people in the in the ring at the same time. And so 
the goal has there probably has been i'm sure they all have like alternates like where pins count or or whatever but um typically the the the, uh the traditional way is that if a person is thrown over the top ropes and they touch the floor they're out um so the goal is to to throw your opponents over the ring over the ropes out of the ring that eliminates them and then you just keep whittling down till there's uh one like i stand in yep um no that's a classic that was on my list too too just because that format just allows itself to like so many stories too where like they're always going to do the thing every so many years we're like oh two partner tag team guys end up in the ring together now they're gonna have to fight i guess <laughs> right or allows like that giant guy to come in the ring and like have like five guys like you said like ready to toss out at one time or <laughs> yeah or or the uh you know they've kind of evolved this through the years too or they have the like i know the wwe i haven't watched a lot of it but i've seen some clips of it too where like somebody will, like fly over the top rope but like Land on some guy who's out of the match's shoulders, and, and therefore they didn't never actually touch the floor. Never touch right? the floor, so or slide <laughs> under the rope, and then they never want to eliminate it. Or, um, yeah, I, I would say that's probably my favorite type of match, just for the it's it's just kind of like chaos. <laughs> there's just so much going on, and oh yeah, you, you never know what's going to happen. Um, I mean, I, I could, you also had, also on the flip side of that is sometimes there's so much going on that it's it's hard to know to be able to pay attention to it <laughs> yeah that's true any individual thing that's happening but um just the uh the unpredictability which is, is a really big thing part of of what makes wrestling fun is is the unpredictability for me and uh i would say that the battle royale certainly gives you the most of that yeah and that's like the like the more you know like the wwf started that style i think at least to my knowledge back in i don't know when late 80s maybe but before, you know they still do like the traditional style of like you start with like 20 in the ring at once and they just go and like that's that's just a cluster fuck that's <laughs> that's not even fun to watch just because you're just subtracting and you can't like you said you can't follow everything and like i don't know um all right. Well, one type I have here is uh, a type that they used in NWA back in the day and then later WCW, and that is war games. So um, typically in this, you have four or more traditionally five people on a team, and it would be a uh, double wrestling ring next to each other with a giant steel cage over top of both of the um, rings. And uh, similar to the Royal Rumble beginning here, you're going to have one on each team to start in the ring and they can go anywhere inside the dual cages that they want wrestling. And then every, I don't know what it is, two minutes or something, they bring in one, almost always the villain team gets the first one just because storytelling and they come (laughs) in and then they have a two on one advantage for two minutes. Um, And then the, the hero team will get their second person in and they'll keep going until Eventually, all five get in, and then um, I've seen that one play out a couple ways, too, where it has to be like a submission to end it, or sometimes a pinfall can end it, or I think I might have seen one even where you could try to get out of the ring on that one, but uh, essentially, you just go till you know, like somebody's beaten to death in the corner, and then they their team loses because they submit or whatever. I should point out, too, like we mentioned that this is fake, but we should also put our little disclaimer in here like people get hurt doing this like oh, all the yeah. time absolutely so that's like career ending stuff occasionally yeah um and we didn't mention that i guess on the outset either but like little injuries happen non-stop and you know you're like oh he's not really hitting him he's like yeah but you try to like jump off a turnbuckle and land and not <laughs> blow your knee out and just you know like so many people get hurt <laughs> so often yeah um and sometimes it's like carelessness. Sometimes it's just something freak happens. And, or like perfect example is a more recent wrestler here. And I always get the names backwards, but uh, Brian Danielson, who's Daniel Bryan at WWE. Daniel Bryan. Yeah. He was at the Friday show that was just on. And as the camera went off the air, apparently he stepped and got his foot stuck between the ramp and the ring, like Ooh. to the point where it took them 15 minutes to actually get him out. Oh, geez. Um, but like <laughs> weird freak stuff happens too. Like it's just, <laughs> it's just crazy stuff. So, but people get hurt all the time. Yeah. Um, okay. War games. Yeah. It's a good one. There's, there's probably a match or two. I don't know if I have them on my list here for later or not, but 
some some classic ones there with the horsemen and um staying in dusty roads some other people in there too so uh what else you got well i would go with next um probably a, a ladder match mm. um you know it, it's it's such a <laughs> it's it's really kind of a just a crazy concept in that you you essentially and, and again there's probably variants but what i'm have in mind is um there's something hanging above the ring whether it's the uh, a championship belt or it's some other object that is the goal for these wrestlers to get they have to, have to climb up on a literal ladder and retrieve whatever is hanging above the ring and then whoever does that you're the winner um and so you'd imagine this it, you're a you person in the ring and they've got like a it's probably like a 10 foot ladder something that range and um imagine trying to set up a ladder in the ring and climb up it and then having however many if there's just one other person or i think usually it's like three or four people in yeah. a match for these it's, it's usually not just one-on-one -on -one. um but having all these people who are trying to like knock the ladder over or just kick you off or or whatever and it, it just it's crazy it just it you always get the uh you know it's always a build-up of somebody's like oh oh they're gonna get they're gonna get it so yeah. like at the very last second and <laughs> and of course because of because of the script and nature of it you always have like somebody like gets up and they're like about to grab it and like why is knowing not going to me down? So I have to like really take my time <laughs> reaching. <laughs> and, uh, but, but those are always fun. It's just, it's just kind of chaos. And um, there's, there's like big buildups and then like uh, something happens and um, yeah, those are a lot of fun for me. Yeah, no, I, I definitely know what you're talking about with the, like <laughs> the 10 seconds on the last run, like trying, <laughs> trying to go up. Um, I just can't seem to get my foot on this wrong. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, those are good. Those have really come a long way too. Like, I think uh, I could be wrong, but I think maybe Shawn Michaels, Razor Ramon might have been the first one of those, I think. Um, and now they're just crazy tag team matches and um, all sorts of stuff. Uh, another one of my favorites here, uh, and this, uh, this can be crappy, so I'm going to put that little caveat out there ahead of time, but some sort of uh they have a lot of different names for these, but some sort of uh, like weapons, anything goes type match. Um, and if the two or more performers in these matches do a compelling enough job, like these matches can really be fantastic. Um, it does sometimes show like the, uh, what do I want to say here? Like the, the, the fake nature, I guess, of the business sometimes. So like they use crazy weapons and thumbtacks and like barbed wire. And sometimes like there's like barbed wire hitting somebody's skin and it's not like not leaving a mark. And you're like, <laughs> um, but then like, I don't know, like there's a famous uh, ECW one with, uh, I believe Terry Funk and Sabu. It's a barbed wire one. And like, they had to bring the bolt cutters over because he had lacerated his bicep and was going to die. So <laughs> it's all over the place, but if they have the weapons and they can tell like a, meaningful enough story with it um there's some fantastic matches that can that can come from that and another advantage of the weapons matches too is like you had kind of mentioned the um unpredictability of it so like generally speaking in wrestling you probably have an idea who's most likely to win that match if not 100 percent likely if it's like what they call squash match but sometimes the weapons can like mitigate that a little bit where you're like, well, this guy normally wouldn't be able to beat this other person, but it gives they, them a chance. And, yeah, <laughs> if they swing a chair, if they find like this other thing, David and Goliath kind of thing. Right. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to put uh, that down as my second type here. All right. Well, I would probably, <laughs> the one thing I wrote down here that I, I, I did want to bring up was, um, and it kind of leads into what you were just talking about was, and I don't know that it was a technical like match type. I, I guess it kind of was, but you know, the ECW was always famous for um, fans bringing weapons in and oh, the yeah. wrestlers <laughs> using weapons that the fans brought to the arena. And I, I think they actually were like, they had specific matches where those things were allowed and other ones where they weren't. I'm not, I'm not quite certain. I don't remember exactly, but yeah, sounds right. Um, 
<laughs> but I, I just remember that some of the, the crazy, just weird, weird stuff that would happen in, in ECW. <laughs> so I, I actually went and I, I searched for like the weirdest things that had been seen <laughs> in ECW because I was really curious because I obviously I didn't see like everything, you know. Yeah. And um, so a list I've got um, a uh, um, stop signs were kind of a prevalent item. Oh, yeah. <laughs> somehow, <laughs> somehow fans would bring a stop sign into the arena. How that happened, I don't know. <laughs> Begs a few questions, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, in 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 one like really famous match, um, someone gave their prosthetic leg, like off their body. <laughs> I think it was um, I think it was uh, Sandman. I think used it or something. <laughs> and, like beat his opponent with someone's prosthetic leg like, out of the these stands. That's pretty amazing. Um, also, there was another famous one where someone brought in a. Now this part wasn't specific. I don't know if if um, if there's actually like somebody out there who knows exactly what it was, but they just said it was a Nintendo console. Now yeah. what was the the NES or the Super it, Nintendo? No, it was the it was? NES. I think I saw that they gave him a pile driver through the NES. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and then uh, the, what was kind of the craziest thing on the list that I found um, was a barbed wire wrapped dildo. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You can just imagine that. Wow. But uh <laughs> yeah. It, it, kind of like what you were you were kind of leaning into. Um also the uh you kind of mentioned like the like kind of the creativity of the performers. Yeah. And can you imagine like in these kind of matches, <laughs> the the you you have to have people who who can think on their feet and be like, what am I gonna do with this? And like come up with something. Yeah. And um yeah. It, that really it, it takes a bit of something that um you know isn't just a general everyday kind of thing you know yeah that's a good call on that one i i was you just reminded me i was at an event probably before covid so it's probably been like three years now but um every once in a while they do like a little like a little little local show around here but like i think i went to one in like peoria and like one in fort wayne indiana like so relatively close far if you want to call it that from me but i think one of the last ones i was at somebody used a i think i want to say it was a painting of black jesus <laughs> 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 like whacked the guy over the head with it i was like i, I got nothing <laughs> i don't need <laughs> oh amazing <laughs> it was pretty good it was pretty good um, let's see what else here. So another one I like your variation of the one I said earlier, but just the more like classic style steel cage match um, with like a one on one climb over the top or go through the door to achieve victory. Or you might sometimes be able to pin or submit to. I don't really know. I guess I guess I guess I've seen them all. Um, yeah. And more recently, I've seen uh, I'll list one here coming up on my matches, but I have seen a uh, more recent uh, tag team match in the steel cage, too, which was just just phenomenal. But just like knowing how to use the cage and like in the last probably 20 ish years, like jumping off the cage is like a fairly common thing now, which is just insane. Right. Yeah. Um, it's like a 25 foot drop. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Or like uh, throwing your opponent into the cage and rubbing their face in the cage or whatever you got. So you got some variations there too. You can't forget the, uh, I won't call it its own thing, but the uh, famous WCW, um, uh, what was it called? The Chamber of Horrors match where they electrocuted Abdullah the Butcher in the middle of the match. Oh yeah, geez. That was, uh, I think that was a one and done style match. I've never seen that <laughs> since then. So a bit too much. <laughs> yeah, it was not, not great. Um <laughs> Got any more over there? Um, no, that that cleaned up my list. I had steel cage on here as well. So, yeah, and that's not to say like these are all kind of gimmicky matches, but I feel like a you know a good storytelling normal match is also very good. Mm. Um, I know recently there's been some matches I've watched too that are just like not like no special rules, but just like time limit 60 minutes or like most falls in 60 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever the case is. And like, you can really tell some really compelling stories with those two of like, I know usually it was like in the olden days, I felt like it was like, he got the first fall and this guy got the second fall and who's going to get the third one. And like, 
there's been a few I've watched in the last year or two where like they advertise it as 60 minutes. You as the viewer kind of know it's going to go 60 minutes and kind of know like on one of them even in particular I was watching, I was like, I don't, I don't think anybody's going to win this. Like it's going to go 60 minutes and it's just going to be a draw. And that sounds boring, but like, it was like the most phenomenal storytelling with wrestling moves that they could make, you know, with their actions yeah. and playing off emotions. And I was like, this is fantastic. Um, just a 60 minute draw, but it was even, even just to wrestle for that long is insane. 60 minutes. I can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's not like they're sitting there, you know, it's not like, well, well we know two people who can kind of imagine. That. <laughs> um, we, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's not, not, not wrong. <laughs> so I just could say the, um, I don't know. I lost that thought, but anyway. Uh, okay. Let's go to, I talk about, uh, maybe some feuds or favorite matches. We were talking about maybe doing matches first and then matches turned out to be much harder than I would have guessed. Like, cause I was mm. trying to go back and remember all these and it ended up, so I'm, I'm kind of in the middle here. I got some feuds mixed in with some matches and some other things as well here. So, um, yeah, for could... me, it was, it was hard. As I said, like, I, I haven't really thought about many of these specifically in my, many many years yeah so, so like individual matches was hard to remember for me to remember um i did go in and kind of search like some of the the best matches you know okay. of that timeline and then that kind of jogged my memory on a few things yeah um, so i did make a, a short list here of just some okay um let's see i'm gonna throw out i'll start maybe counting with some older ones i have here so one of the earliest uh i guess you call it a feud because it went for like 10 years, but one of the earliest matches is the uh, famous 60 minute uh, match with Sting and Ric Flair when Sting was like a new wrestler and Ric Flair was the established champion and just kind of the story of the young rookie who could, you know, keep the, I mean, most people would argue one of the better wrestlers of all time, like in threat mode for 60 minutes was pretty impressive. Um, that was kind of like, I think his coming out party of the world stings you know to be like here's this new guy who's awesome i don't have a date or a time on that i don't know what it was. i think it was maybe the first clash of the champions which were like free pay-per-views they used to do essentially i uh th this first one i'm going to talk about i i don't I'm, oh, I'm certain i never actually saw the entirety of the match because it was on a pay-per-view that i i'm certain i didn't see the pay-per-view okay but it was um there was there was so much you know, clips and, and news and stories and things from it afterwards that um, just the kind of the, well, first of all, the brutality of it kind of was, uh, you know, just kind of legendary almost. And um, it was, I, I think it was, if I'm right, I think it was the first Hell in a Cell match. And it's the one between uh, Mankind and Undertaker. Okay. And uh, yeah, so as it was a, a steel cage match for those who don't aren't familiar with it at all, um, and it was between the Undertaker and, and Mankind, who were both were um, the Undertaker wasn't really known for like um, like really hardcore kind of stuff, but right. his his character is an undertaker and um was, was routinely like his, his his gimmick was um having to do with dead things so he was kind of like this this kind of morbid creature um and then mankind who came from uh really hardcore roots um and he just got completely beat to crap in that match um i think kind of kind of culminating in um the moment where Undertaker and, and Mankind are on, on top of the cage. So this, this cage above the ring. And so you're like 15 feet above the ring, something like that. And Undertaker like choke slams Mankind into the top of the cage and he falls through the top of the cage down onto the mat. And I think, I think there was thumbtacks on the mat at the time as well. <laughs> um, and I, I don't know, I think there was, there was like a point where Mankind like had a tooth like coming through his lip. Oh. I don't know if, if that was the same match or not. I, I, I feel like it was. Um, but 
yeah, that, that was just, it was so, and they, they've kind of copied that, that, that hell in a cell format, you know, several times since then. I, I think, I think that was the first one and it was kind of, kind of legendary. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds right. One of my favorites was the whole uh, NWO versus WCW moment where we had the new world order, which was legendarily when Hulk Hogan turned bad for the real first time in a long time in his career um, and joined up with Hall and Nash. And then they took on WCW, the company. Um, But the best, I mean, that part was great. Um, And then the other part that made that angle so good was WCW was kind of known for terrible planning and booking of what they were going to have on their shows. But one of the (laughs) smartest things they did was somehow somehow made sting ridiculously popular by not having him wrestle for a year <laughs> <laughs> right and hide up in the rafters but it kind of paid <laughs> off uh until they had the match where they promptly <laughs> screwed it up and had hulk hogan win and then they had to switch the decision apparently. so yeah that was an incredible series of events <laughs> yeah but you're right it, it was like his absence made him like elevated his status yeah. by, by not being there by not wrestling his his um his legend his status actually went considerably higher yeah i was, remember he was, he was already quite high before that yeah i remember when we were in high school like kids from i don't even know if it was the grade ahead of us or behind us but i just remember like seeing them like talk to each other and they like sting showed up he was there he was there it's <laughs> like well, it's working, I guess. They're, they're paying attention to what's happening. So, um, all right. What do you got for your next one? Uh, well, since uh, since you just kind of brought it up, I will uh, go with a match that I actually did see in per- in person. Was well, not physically in person, but um, on the screen was that uh, that infamous uh, hostile takeover match where where Hogan turned heel for the first time or yeah big for the first time that that is probably the the biggest moment that i really recall in wrestling because it never it never in a thousand years would have ever expected that that hogan was going to be the bad guy yeah and you know that that match was um and i i didn't remember all these details until i looked it up earlier but um so you had it was, a, it was a three versus three. It was like the the New World Order. These these bad guys coming to try to take over everything, yeah. And then uh, versus like the three, the the WCW put up their like the three kind of faces that they had, and um, it was um. Now I'm not remembering how it happened exactly, but but essentially <laughs> the NWO had like all three of their guys and like, oh that's what it was. It's was like Luger got hurt. Lex Luger got like hurt early in the match. So they're, they're like down two to three, essentially. So he always like this, this thick and like the good guys have to fight back and fight back. And, and then at the end of the match, you get Hogan come running out. He wasn't in the match, but he comes out and you're like, Oh my God, he's going to save everything. And he's going to, he's going to whoop his NWO butts. And, and here he comes and he drops a leg right on Randy Savage's face. <laughs> and that, that moment, I, I just remember being stunned. Like, no you what no yeah and it was it was so big you're absolutely right that was yeah and it's part i mean so we talk about like you gotta keep your character fresh in wrestling but like a lot of times they do that by having people switch from being good to bad or bad to good again and you know how long they make those sections last is kind of how long they can stay in the business for but yeah hogan was like you know one of very 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 few who like i don't think was ever evil and so yeah so not many i'm just trying to think like sting maybe i guess was never bad that i can recall and like ultimate warrior maybe but it's like the fact that you're coming up with like the biggest names here are like it kind of tells you the story what you need to know because i don't even know if there's like is there an equivalent of like bad i feel like everybody that was a massive bad guy turned good at some point i don't even know it's a good question. Um, I don't know if there's an equivalent to that or not. Hmm. I think like John Cena, they say it was kind of like a more modern day, like was always good and never let him switch into be a bad guy. That's possible. That sounds about right. 
although <laughs> from from my history i like i i mean i'm certainly quite aware of john cena like his appearance and his name but yeah i really haven't seen anything about him okay you know? that's fair that's fair all right let's see my next one i'm going to jump promotions over here for a minute and uh, i'm going to talk about um well, I'm going to save that one in case it's on Brett's list next, which <laughs> might be coming up here. But I'm going to switch to another duo here. And this is um, one of the pairings I really, I guess it was a trio technically, that I really enjoyed watching was the ECW trio of Sabu and Rob Van Dam and their manager, Bill Alfonso. And this was a group that, at various times promoted themselves as like anti ECW within ECW. And sometimes they fought each other. They had little rivalries going on, but essentially at their peak, what you had was Bill Alfonso, who um, you're likely to not know if you're not a pro wrestling fan, but would wear like a baseball cap to the ring and have his whistle that he would shrill on nonstop through matches to the point of being very, very annoying. <laughs> yeah. And um, then you had Rob Van Dam, who was in his day and age, probably one of the more athletically gifted competitors um, with what he could do in terms of like jumping and balancing and kicking. I think yeah, he was for, sure. uh, for, for being such a big guy, too. Yeah, I think he was, you know, probably just into martial arts quite a bit. And I, th I think I had read that he like he got his name basically because he looked mildly like John claude Van Dam. So he was Rob Van Dam. <laughs> Right. Um, but he could just jump off the turnbuckle and like kick people in the opposite corner and like fly and he could do all sorts of stuff in the air. Then you had Sabu, who was the uh what, what they call him the um genocidal, homicidal, suicidal maniac or something along oh those gosh, lines. Yeah. Some some moniker similar to that, but <laughs> Essentially, it was this guy who just put his body through abuse for the sake of putting his body through abuse and looking cool and um, always earned credit with the audience, I think, but probably shortened his career considerably due to the way he wrestled. I mean, like I aforementioned barbed wire and his finishing maneuver was like dropping off the top turnbuckle and smacking a chair between his leg and a guy's face and like <laughs> it had to do as much damage to himself oh, for as sure yeah every single time some of those moves are just kind of <laughs> kind of crazy but uh they were a fun duo to watch like i said sometimes most of the time they were a tag team but sometimes they would also fight each other as well and then you had alfonso running around there just kind of pissing everybody off so <laughs> <laughs> all right well i um i'm gonna stay in ecw as well and uh, the third one I had written down here was one I believe I saw uh, with my own eyes, um, you know, because we did watch some ECW, sh you know, shows occasionally. And um, that was the Dudley Boys final match in ECW hmm. um, where they fought Spike Dudley and um, and uh, what was the other one? I forget it now, but. Essentially, it was like another member of the Dudley Boys, I think, the you know, the pack there. Okay. Um, and so this, what was crazy about this match was, I I don't think it was like the first time, but this was like one of those flaming table matches. Oh, and, okay. Uh, so th this was the one where, and, and as I read it, you know, the, the Dudley Boys had already, they, they were leaving for, for WWF. And, um, and the crowd knew that. And so the whole time the crowd is like, like just booing these guys, like as much as they can, because they know that they're, they're leaving their home, you know, to go yeah. get, grab that money. And, um, but, but I actually, I watched the clip earlier too. And you, you can hear the, the change, like a, a massive change in the, in the audience when they like set up the tables and, um, and uh, Bob Ray's got spike. And he's like, oh, and they, they, they pour the, the, um, the lighter fluid on the table. So oh, the yeah. whole crowd just goes bonkers. And it wasn't one table. It was two. It was two tables stacked up, both of them on fire. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he just slams this little spike through both tables. And the crowd went crazy. Just, just a, the amount of stuff like that that happened in ECW was, yeah. it, you, you would think that at a point it would kind of kind of numb you 
to it. Mm -hmm. But but still, it is just amazing. Yeah, they would do something like that. And they were like I said, we could do episodes on a lot of these things. But they were always um, a cool company too because they'd have you know like that hardcore match like you're saying. But then like the next, the very next match could be like Eddie Guerrero versus Chris Benoit, and like a, a super the, technical, yeah, a super technical match. Or like Luchadors like, were there, yeah. I think before even WSW and. So they really had a little bit of everything. Um, okay, I'm going to jump around here a bit again. So the next one I'm going to go with, I'm going to put two together on this one. It's kind of cheating and they're different companies, <laughs> but I'll tell you why. So the first one I have down is a match from Lucha Underground um, with two ladies called Sexy Star and uh, Mariposa. Sexy Star was like the, the face. Mariposa was the heel who came from like a crazy demented family. And then from AEW more recently, uh, was actually voted uh, match of the year last year in the wrestling awards, which oh. was um, Dr. Britt Baker DMD, who was the evil uh, lady doctor, a dentist, I should say, um, versus it's way better than it sounds, believe it or not, uh, oh, versus I'll Thunder Rosa, who is like a Texas uh, Mexican lady wrestler. But both of these matches have something in common, and that is they were both um, anything goes women's matches. And this is, I don't know if it comes off as sexist or not, but just purely going through like the history of pro wrestling, that's not a match type I had seen filled very often like a women's no, hardcore would, yeah. anything goes match and these were both fantastic um the one from lucha underground like they i they literally just beat the shit out of each other for like a half hour straight and <laughs> i was i was just blown away because like you see men do it sometimes but like i hadn't seen women do it before and i was like this is insane like they're just hitting each other with weapons and like taking these crazy high dives and any, you know, thumbtacks are coming in. And then the, I didn't actually see all of the um, AEW one either, but I've seen like the, the two rematches that they had after that. And same thing, like, just like fill your opponent's mouth with thumbtacks and then smack them in the <laughs> face with the chair and like, just, just the sickest stuff. And again, it was like crazy, dangerously violent things and like i hadn't seen women really do that so um i guess i don't know women wrestlers always seem to want to like get equality so i guess that's one more thing they are now equal in than they <laughs> were before so yeah i can't say that i've ever seen a match like a hardcore women's match yeah you and know, that's they're all they've all that i can remember were just all kind of like straight up just matches yeah absolutely um you got any more i do not all right let's see here i'll do maybe one or two more of these here uh I'll, what i thought you were gonna have on there but why i didn't say it earlier is uh the i don't even know how many years long this this was maybe two but it was the tommy dreamer raven feud from oh. ecw which i thought you'd pick because of your affinity for raven so <laughs> yeah this was another crazy one that had like this one was very brutal with chairs and handcuffs and other things as well, but also had the like best of the soap opera e moments of like so and so's pregnant and so and so's <laughs> dating you now. And but uh, they would always Tommy Dreamer was kind of known as like a clean cut dude when he started, and then I think he, as I think as the legend goes, like made himself take all of these crazy sick bumps and get hurt a lot just to like show people he was tough and ravens mm -hmm. at least ecw character less so in wcw but kind of the same was just very ultra violent as well like just right <laughs> ddt on your stop sign you talked about or whatever the case was <laughs> gonna be um so that one's good and let's see let's put another couple out here quickly um so two, I mentioned this one earlier, but two of the more recent ones from AEW that I really enjoy uh, match-wise were the 60-minute match I mentioned earlier. This was uh, Brian Danielson, who fights in AEW now, um, versus a guy called Hangman Adam Page. And like I said, it was just a straight-up match in 60 minutes. Nobody even pinned or submitted the other guy, but it was just mm -hmm. like such a good match to watch. Like, you know, and it's, 
even as a wrestling fan when i'm like watching something and they're like this is a 60 minute match and you're like <laughs> like it's hard to get invested in that you know because like right odds are nothing's gonna happen for the first 45 minutes even though they're working their ass off but yeah that, that's fair that's fair <laughs> storyline wise nothing's likely to happen but um yeah that's, that's kind of like one... with with anything in life if you hear it's gonna be like a long thing it's yeah like, eh, do i want to get involved with this yeah Maybe not. um but it was fantastic also just the whole way through and then um last one i'll say here and then we can cut ahead here is um tag match i mentioned in a steel cage recently um they had the so the setup here for this one this was at aew's pay-per-view all out in 2021 um, and they had a tag team called the Young Bucks, who have been big, I guess, like for 10 plus years on the indie scene and now are big here and helped uh, found this company. But they're, twi- I don't know if they're twin brothers, but they're at least brothers who look very similar, um, who are known for like jumping and kicking and doing all these acrobatic and very fast moves versus the, so they were the bad guys in the match versus the uh, Lucha brothers who are uh i I enjoy this tag team quite a bit but they are from lucha underground that other promotion i talked about a lot of those people have made their way to aew now Mm. Um, but this is a tag team call um sorry not a tag team Uh, two people they are tagging but their names are uh, ray fenix and penta who switches his last part of his name quite a bit but anyway um they were the the victory not the victory. Oh my gosh, I can't talk. They were the faces, the heroes in the movie. In the movie. Oh my god, what's <laughs> happening right now? Seriously, and I'm just drinking like water. I swear, it's caffeinated. But this is, I'm all over the place. Anyway, long story short, this was in a cage. It was fantastic. It was. Um, I think they had some ladders in there, some tables. Like it was just craziness. And like the two of them are Mexican wrestlers. So like you remember, you know, the, the Mexican wrestlers have a huge tradition with like their masks and like they can't have their faces be seen. And so the other team was like, had already like ripped apart and yanked like areas of the masks, like really wide. And like you could start to see people's faces. And mm-hmm. there was a uh, part where they had um, Penta's face, like almost completely out of the mask. And he's kind of like, uh, it kind of looks similar to like La Parca did like a skeleton kind of motif type thing and um but anyway they the the good team ended up winning and beating the 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 young bucks and they had been they had been the tag champs for like maybe 14 months like it had been a pretty long run so like anybody that finally beat them was a big story and then Mm -hmm. like there was a shot of he had uh penta had his daughter of all things there ringside at the match and she was you know like three feet tall and so there's like a good picture of like him all bloody with his mask all like hanging <laughs> apart but like with the with the title and with his daughter and like it's yeah. just, a, just a cool moment just to see some stuff like that so mm-hmm. cool yeah um i got some other ones on here too but i won't go into all of these but i do think we should at least put a uh shout out to the uh tlc tables ladders and chairs matches with the dudleys edge and christian and the hardy boys because they were kind of innovative with that also yeah i don't know that i really saw many of them myself but i i I know those are like legendary yeah some of the best matches that uh wwe you know has has put out yeah and i'd agree with that i don't know that i've actually seen too many of them if many at all but i know again influence wise they're right there so um, okay, are we up to our top wrestlers for this one? I think we probably gotta, could, unless you want to. Um, what do you got for another topic? Um, yeah, we could maybe just, there's like a couple of highlights here, I suppose, that we haven't. Uh, well, let's see. What do I got on my list here? Just the Judy Bagwell on a pole match. <laughs> are you going to bring up David Arquette winning the world title? Oh, my God. <laughs> I've tried to forget that for so long. <laughs> <laughs> that and Dennis Rodman. Oh, jeez. You have rosy thoughts if you're picturing Dennis Rodman instead of Jay Leno doing a arm drag. <laughs> That's a oh, thing that God. happened to your listener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you, you weren't interested in watching wrestling before, then uh, you surely are now. Hulk Hogan, Hulk Hogan sold an arm drag by Jay Leno 
in the middle <laughs> of a 10,000 motorcycle rally in Sturgis, South Dakota. You can't write this, folks. That's what it is. <laughs> um, yes. Just look at my, I, I guess we, we kind of touched on most of the things that I have on my list for like highlights. Um, you know, things like, like Sting wearing the uh, the crow makeup and, and literally being in the rafters of the building and like watching things from down from the rafters yeah and um and then you know he, he started like you know when he started coming literally coming down to the ring out of the rafters was like just insane and yeah. it, it kind of like it really it was, it was a combination of like the crow um like for the movie the crow and like batman <laughs> Yeah, so it really was, and he, he really went from like from superstar to like superhero. Really, I mean, yeah, it was not far off from being like a you can see him in the Avengers or something. I I mean, yes, I can still see that. <laughs> so Sting is uh, still wrestling today, believe it or not, in AEW. Oh, right. He is, I think, sixty five, and like a year ago, has just started doing like balcony dives and stuff now. Like he is oh, doing stuff God. now that he was not doing then. I don't understand how wow. or why. But his <laughs> other fun thing is when anybody hits him with a chair, he completely no sells it and just turns around and like beats the shit out of them. So nice. That's that. I like, that part didn't even funny. phase me. That's what it is. I love it. <laughs> um. I get a couple of things that are like like Goldberg's insane streak. Oh yeah, um, which was re- reportedly was um, like artificially inflated, but I think his official win streak was like 170 some matches. <laughs> but it's, it's funny because I, I actually looked. It was one of the things I was just going through earlier today, and I looked up and um on wikipedia i mean trust wikipedia how much you want to but yeah um they have the entire list of every match that he had and like dated and where it was so it's like it's it's pretty (laughs) it's pretty solid um you know work here um but you'll see things like um like he he beat the giant like four matches in a row in like five days okay (laughs) but you know they're like uh, like it's like WCW house show, which those weren't televised. Okay. And so it would be very easy for them to just stick in a match. <laughs> you know, it was like, this happened. You weren't there. You couldn't see it. You know? Yeah. So, and, and it's just really convenient that it's like the same person, like three days in a row, <laughs> that he beat. but they're all count towards his record. That's um, funny. But yeah, that's, that's just a crazy thing I had down here. And, um, uh, but I was just, just like the ECW chance in general. I thought was just just oh, a fun yeah. thing to talk about because uh, the crowd in ECW was was so crazy. They're just so passionate about what they're there for and watching, and um, you know the, the volume and intensity of of things they would chant was was almost as impressive as the thing the, what they were actually chanting which <laughs> which which often was not not very um family friendly yeah that's a good point i i recall that she's a crack horror chant uh, which, <laughs> amongst others <laughs> that's good stuff um, I, I think pretty much everything else i have in my highlights we we kind of skimmed over at some point or another so Well, Brett, we didn't even get our top 10 wrestlers in this episode. Nevertheless, dear listener, we hope you enjoyed hearing us talking about our favorite matches, match types, some of our favorite feuds and memorable moments, etc. We'll come back to you again with our top 10 pro wrestlers. Until then, this is the American Dream, Death to Road, the Daddy. This has been the friend, the occasionally not disagreeing. That's right, Daddy. Stay cool. Stay soft in those hard times. Dusty out.